News 46, local coverage you can count on. Partners Medical Group. Our mission is to provide the highest quality of health care to each and every patient. With five locations in Pahrump, we are local doctors you know and trust. We want to thank you for choosing us. Quality care starts here. Pahrump Nugget, Progressive Cash Drawings, Mystery Point Multipliers, Mystery Gift Days, Extra Cash for Four of a Kinds, Bingo Bowling Football and Food Specials. Looking for constant action? Look no further. Pahrump Nugget Hotel and Casino. Harum's most watched and number one media source for local news and weather with Deanna O'Donnell. Welcome to News 46's Week in Review, your number one source for local news. I'm Deanna O'Donnell. And I'm Zach Fuentes. A fatal accident occurred on Pahrump Valley Boulevard this past weekend. Yesterday morning here, approximately 7 a.m., Nye County Sheriff's deputies received a report of a man lying on the side of the road. Perhaps a man with a bicycle. Nye County Sheriff's deputies arrived on scene at Pahrump Valley Boulevard and Casey just after 7 a.m. to find a deceased individual and his bike, as well as a backpack lying right here. The man appeared to have been here for a while. There was reports coming back that he was in fact cold and was in fact deceased. It appears that the bicycle was damaged in some sort of accident. Deputies blocked off the roadway as well as set up a perimeter for a crime scene. Detectives as well arrived on scene. They searched the backpack to see if they could locate any identification. It appears that somehow or another this individual's bike was struck by a vehicle. It appears that the victim and the bike actually had to have been hit with some sort of force because they were ways off the roadway. Nye County Sheriff's deputies conducted their investigation, which went on from several hours. They the mortuary actually came on scene approximately 1.30 in the afternoon here to remove the body. We do know that the next of kin has been notified. We don't have any leads at this point as to the vehicle or suspect or if this was even an accident. In fact, Nye County Sheriff's deputies are conducting this investigation. Of course, we'll let you know as soon as we hear anything. This is Deanna O'Donnell on Prompt Valley Boulevard and Casey for News 46. The Nye County detectives are investigating leads based on evidence left at the scene on Front Valley Boulevard and Casey Street. 35-year-old father of two, Michael Flannery, was killed Saturday night after being struck by a vehicle in a hit-and-run accident. Flannery was riding his bike home after a family gathering on Dollar Street. Sunday at approximately 7 o'clock in the morning, Nye County Sheriff's Office was dispatched to investigate a possible deceased person on Prompt Valley Boulevard. Upon arriving, it was discovered that an adult male had been involved in a hit-and-run accident. The victim, later identified as Michael Flannery, was pronounced dead on scene. The Nye County Sheriff's Office Accident Investigation Deputies as well as Detectives Division investigated the scene. Evidence recovered from the scene indicated a single vehicle had struck Flannery from the rear while Flannery was riding his bicycle. The positioning of the injuries on the victim and the damage to the bicycle indicate that Flannery was traveling northbound on Pahrump Valley Boulevard when he was struck from behind by a motor vehicle. No skid marks were located, indicating any means of braking after or prior to the collision. The bicycle was not equipped with any lights and minimal reflectors on the pedals. Flannery was not wearing any reflective riding gear or helmet. Flannery suffered a broken neck a hip along with internal injuries according to the preliminary post-mortem examination. The Nye County Sheriff's Office is actively investigating leads from evidence left behind at the scene. Anyone with information in regards to this incident is urged to contact the Nye County Sheriff's Office at 751-7000 or secret witness at 727-4900. Detectives are following up on leads and the investigation is ongoing. This is Deanna O'Donnell for News 46. Detectives have released details regarding the fatal accident that killed 35-year-old father of two, Michael Flannery, last Saturday night on Pahrump Valley Boulevard. KPVM has been receiving numerous calls regarding the Flannery accident. The funeral is most likely going to be held in California, where Michael was from. 
Detectives report that Flannery was killed sometime between 6.30 and 7 p.m. on Saturday night as he was riding his bicycle northbound near Casey Street. He was on his way home to a residence on Basin Avenue after a family gathering on Dollar Street. Detectives say that they have developed several leads from evidence that was left on scene. They are sending off to a lab to identify the make and model of a car that killed the father of two. A post-mortem investigation revealed that he suffered a broken neck, a hip, as well as internal injuries. A cross, flowers, and a candle has been placed in the spot where his body was located Sunday morning at approximately 7 a.m. after dispatch was called to send a deputy for a suspicious incident in which a man was lying on the side of the road. If you have any information regarding this accident, you are encouraged to call the sheriff's office at 751-7000. This is Deanna O'Donnell for News 46. Also, we have been getting requests from people who would like to help the family. We are attempting to get contact information for this purpose. And a candlelight vigil will be held this Saturday at 7 p.m. at Prompt Valley Boulevard and Casey Street for that accident victim, Michael Flannery. Tragedy. Well, Nico's Pizza gets an unexpected guest through their front door. We're here at the corner of Postal Drive and Loop Road. We're around 11.30 this morning. A vehicle entered the structure of Nico's Pizza. Pahrump Valley Fire and Rescue arrived on scene along with Nye County Sheriff's deputies. We're going to speak to Fire Chief Scott Lewis. We were dispatched for a report of a vehicle versus building. And as you can see, a vehicle actually went through the front doors of this particular restaurant. And as the vehicle became lodged in such a fashion that the occupants were unable to aggress on their own. So it was upgraded to a rescue assignment was found out that there was no injuries as a result of this accident, but we're evaluating the structural integrity of the front to make sure that it'll be safe for anyone, removal of the vehicle, and whether or not it can reopen for business. Because it seems to have went through the glass and door area, so we're not quite sure. I know that Valley Electro is coming on scene as well. They're going to arrive on location. They're going to evaluate to see whether the, the power is affected in any way along that front wall that faces Postal. And we also have buildings and safety on location because it just didn't damage the front doors. It actually took out some of the header and support materials around it. So we're going to make sure it's safe today before we leave. And I know that this is Nico's Pizza here. None of the employees got injured in this accident? Uh, not that I'm aware of, the, there were no patrons inside at the time, and uh, so again, a very fortunate situation today. Nobody was transported? Nobody is being transported. What did we use to extricate the actual victims? We went in there and used makeshift tools, uh, pry bars and such to allow us to enter into the vehicle, remove those people. Uh, again, um, a relatively easy operation, it was just given the, the logistics within the building where that extrication had to take place. Is the person saying at this point why this happened or how this happened? Uh, I think the, that's under investigation by the sheriff's office. Uh, our biggest concern was is the building and also the occupants. News 46 has learned that the driver of this vehicle was in fact the owner of Nikos Pizza, Jim's son, who is actually going for his driver's license on Thursday. He pulled up to find the vehicle inside his building realizing that it was in fact his car driven by his son who was attempting to learn how to drive. Also as well, building and safety arrived on scene and they have closed down the building until repairs are done. They said that the integrity of the structure has been compromised. And until those repairs are done, Nico's Pizza will be closed. This is Deanna O'Donnell on the corner of Loop and Postal for News 46. Car slammed into a Las Vegas City paving truck early last week on Interstate 15 near Spring Mountain Road, killing a female passenger in the car. Nevada Highway Patrol Trooper Jeremy Elliott said the accident occurred about 12.53 a.m. in the southbound lanes of the highway. Witnesses told investigators that a black BMW sedan was traveling in the far left lane of I-15 at a high rate of speed when it veered to the right, fishtailed, and spun out. They say the car slid toward the middle of the highway and struck the unoccupied flatbed work truck which was parked along the median. The truck reportedly had its amber flashers and arrow board in operation at the time of the crash. Road crew workers were in the area at the time of the accident and were uninjured. The BMW's female passenger died on impact and was identified as 19-year-old Olivia Moda. The driver, a male, was transported to University Medical Center with head trauma. His condition isn't immediately known at this time. Very sad. Well, a Marine Carry team moves a transfer case containing the remains of John Luke Bateman this past Tuesday at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. According to the Department of Defense, Bateman, listed as being from Tulsa, Oklahoma, is actually a 2007 graduate from Prompt Valley High School, where he participated in junior ROTC. 
Bateman died while supporting Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. His funeral will be reportedly held at Prump Valley Mortuary on January 27th, and graveside services will be held the 28th at Boulder Veterans Cemetery. In lieu of flowers, please send donations to fisherhouse.org. That's what his family requested. This supports military housing for dependents whose military family is in the hospital. Well, a 1 in 32-year-old woman was arrested on Monday. On January 16, 2012, Nye County Sheriff's Office detectives observed Elizabeth Dowdy on Black Road. They were aware that Dowdy was wanted for auto burglaries for several cases by NCSO deputies. Elizabeth Dowdy is 32 years old and a Pahrump resident. Detectives inquired of Dowdy what her name was and she provided someone else's name and a date of birth. She was arrested and she admitted that she had provided the false information to avoid prosecution because she knew NCSO deputies were looking for her. During the investigation, it was identified that Dowdy was under the influence of marijuana, methamphetamine, and amphetamine. Dowdy was booked into NCSO detention center on charges of using ID information of another, three counts of being under the influence of controlled substances, and also several counts of auto burglary. I'm Nathan Hollenbeck for News 46. Still more local news to come when News 46's News in Reviews returns. Harum's most watched and number one media source for local news and weather with Deanna O'Donnell. Welcome back to News 46. The Palm Valley Chamber of Commerce held its officers installation dinner last Saturday night at Mountain Falls. Here at Mountain Falls on Saturday night was the Prump Valley Chamber of Commerce installation dinner. We're going to speak to CEO Mike Dre. Um, this is when we install our new members and we have them sworn in and this year we had uh, four brand new members come in and take uh, spots of outgoing directors. And so these are the directors. Who, who did we get new for the Chamber of Commerce? Our new directors this year are um, Secretary would be uh, Deborah Davis from Mount, uh, William Lyons, uh, Barbara Thompson from American First National, she's our treasurer, and then directors we got Brian Strain from uh, State Farm, and Skip Haddock from ABB Roofing. And then Nick Moore? Nick Moore took over the spot of president. He replaced me this year. Mm -hmm. And then uh, vice president, was the role was taken on by Charlie Benfonte. There you go. And of course, you're staying as CEO. Well, I, I stepped down. I had one more year left on my, on my contract, but I stepped down from the board of directors to take over the position of CEO, which was held by Michael Selbach, who's now becoming our marketing director. Oh, there you go. And um, this event is so wonderful. People mingle. It's, the, it's installing the new officers for the Prompt Valley Chamber of Commerce. Tell a little bit about uh, what we had going on here tonight. We had a raffle. We had a little bit of entertainment. Well, this is a, a special moment for us because we get an opportunity to recognize our directors and let the let the membership actually see who's governing the, uh, the Prompt Valley uh, Chamber of Commerce this year. Um, the other nice thing is, as president, you get an opportunity to award, you get to choose the three awards that go out, which we do a Cornerstone Business Award, a Cornerstone Nonprofit Award, and we do a Volunteer of the Year Award. So, and that's, that was my favorite thing. I got to do it two times because I took over for Jeff Meads at the end of his year. So, that's my most favorite, most favorite part of it. One of the, uh, well, the Volunteer of the, of the Year Award went to Linda DeMeo. That's correct. Uh, we chose Linda DeMeo this year's Volunteer of the Year Award based on um, how much community service she's, uh, she's provided to this community. And she does all the time, uh, of course, uh, talking about the veterans and uh, the community dinners that she does and continues to do volunteer work all the time. Yeah, she, her, her big thing is she does a lot for the veterans. She volunteers at the VFW. She does the Thanksgiving dinners for the homeless or the less fortunate. Same with Christmas. Uh, she also does stuff for the sheriff's department to support them. So she, she really does a lot in the community. Exactly. Cornerstone Business Award went to Desert View Hospital. That's correct. Desert View Hospital uh, has become a pillar of this community you know, on what they what they stand for. You know, they're 
they're all about supporting the community. How can we help? You know, between shot clinics and health fairs, uh, it's just amazing what they give back to this community. And even the food drives that they do. Yeah, they also help with food drives. They have a, a special one they do every year where it's a big competition between them and uh, VEA to see who can raise the most uh, most dollar amount on food. And then the nonprofit went to Nine Communities Coalition. Yeah, the, this year we chose Nine Communities Coalition. Um, you know, as we all know, the, we're suffering a little bit in the workforce because uh, the economy. There's not many jobs to be had. So, what they bring to the community is an opportunity to uh, cross train, maybe learn a new new profession that uh, to try to help you get a job. So, we felt uh, what they're doing with the youth and the adults in this community on trying to train them to go out into the workforce, we felt they deserved the award. And of course, if people want to become a chamber member or use the services of chamber members, they can give the Front Valley Chamber of Commerce a call? That's correct. Um, anybody looking forward to becoming a member of the Front Valley Chamber of Commerce, you can contact uh, our office, which the number is 727-5800, uh, ask for Nancy. If you have any specific questions that you need answered, you can call Nancy. Uh, ask for me, Mike Dreyer. Uh, she'll give you my cell number and I'd be happy to talk to them. And if you would like to become a chamber member, give them a call at 727-5800 or you can go on the web to promptvalleychamber.com. This is Deanna O'Donnell for News 46. Meet the new Chamber of Commerce President, Nick Moore. We are going to speak to the new president of the Prump Valley Chamber of Commerce, Nick Moore. Chamber of Commerce is just the central point for, the, kind of the voice for a lot of the businesses try to drive commerce just a one focal point for all the businesses to come together and you know the main focus is to, to keep shopping local and support each each business and and uh, just drive traffic to our town and and try to create more commerce for, for the valley and more um, you know just general support I know that uh, the Chamber has been getting um, so much more active. Tell me what we're looking forward to in 2012 now. Well, I mean, uh, we've got a lot of great things going right now. I mean, the Chamber is in a really uh, healthy position now. Uh, we've had some rough years, and, uh, you know, we, we've got some amazing directors that are, are really, uh, you know, it's a volunteer army. And so... Uh, they're really giving a lot of a lot of their time, and uh, it's it's really paying off because the the cha the, the you know it's it's extremely tough times out there. I mean, we're seeing a lot of positive growth right now with all the new businesses coming in. We are losing some, but I mean, I think you know it's a really bright future, and I think if we just stay on this path, that um, you know we've got some really good days ahead of us. And if you would like to utilize the services of the Prompt Valley Chamber of Commerce, find out some businesses that you might need to use their services, you can give the Chamber of Call at 727-5800. This is Deanna O'Donnell for News 46. Dan Schwartz is running for congressman. We caught up to him at the Republican Women's Association meeting at the Prompt Senior Center. I'm running for the open seat in the 4th Congressional District, which is uh, North Las Vegas and the six rural counties almost up to Reno. So this seat became open because of the redistricting here. Yeah, what ended up happening is uh, Joe Hex district and Shelley Berkeley's district each went up to about a million. Those needed to be cut back and they created a new district which uh, I think is very interesting. As they say half is in North Las Vegas and the other half is the rural county. So it's a very uh, diverse district. It really is. Um, who's your opponent at this point? Well, right now I have uh, one announced and one unannounced. Uh, the announced is Barbara Sagaski and the unannounced is Danny Tarkania. Oh, really? Tell me a little bit about a history about yourself. Sure. Uh, I was born in Chicago. Uh, I went to law school, business school, uh, served in the Army as one of the few in my class that did that. Uh, went to um, uh, the, worked in the financial district and then uh, basically became an entrepreneur. Uh, I started a couple businesses, uh, one in Hong Kong, uh, the other in New York, and then I have some other uh, investments that I'm involved in. Any other political background? No, uh, I think that's one of the um, positive aspects of the campaign uh, is I am not a career politician. Uh, I haven't run for office before. Uh, I don't put up yard signs. Uh, I have a skill set and I have a resume which I think uh, will do some good in Washington. What prompted you to want to run for this? 
Uh, good question. Um, our country is no longer uh, at the crossroads. Uh, options that might have been available to us uh, years ago no longer exist. Uh, we're against the wall, and we need to make tough decisions. You're a Republican? Yes. Yeah. Tell me what you hope to do in that district. Uh, what I hope to do is to bring to Washington a certain mindset that one recreates the federal partnership. Uh, our states are no longer partners in government. They are glorified lobbyists. Uh, I hope to be able to attack some of the problems in our district. Uh, the joblessness, we have the highest unemployment in the country. We have the highest foreclosure rate in the country. And both of those need to be addressed. Uh, I hope to bring jobs here. I think we've got to work with our small businesses. Um, our tax system needs a complete overhaul. Um, we're at a point now where uh, our generation is going to be fine. Uh, the next generation is going to be left a stack of bills unless we do something about it. Where can people find out more information about you and your campaign? Sure. Um, our website is uh, schwartzforcongress.com, and that's uh, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z for congress.com. Uh, there's a great video there if you like movies, and then I've got uh, eight or nine issues which I address in a, in a tab under issues. Last week, the 10th annual All People's Breakfast was held at the Prompt Nugget. Well, here at the Prompt Nugget was the 10th annual Martin Luther King All People's Breakfast. We're going to speak to Dolores Joyner. It was a beautiful event, and the town really showed out. I just appreciate everything and everyone and the support. And I said, we're going to have some money this year to give to the children. There you go. This is all for a scholarship fund, isn't it? Yes, it is. We uh, present this money on awards night at the Pahrump Valley High School. And, and I know we had some really talented MCs up there. Who was that? Uh, we had the sheriff of uh, Pahrump, um, Tony DeMeo, and his beautiful wife, Linda DeMeo, with our MCs this time. And how much money did we earn last year for the scholarship? Last year, we were the worst year we've had in a long time. We were able to give two $1,000 scholarships away. But I can foresee much more this year. <laughs> A packed room, and I know that we had Richard Lewis up there um, uh, doing the I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Yes, and he's from out of Vegas, and he drove down, him and his beautiful wife this morning, his son, to do the speech for us, and we really appreciate it. And people like, love to hear it because he sounds just like Martin Luther King. <laughs> Wonderful. And we had the praise dancers and the Martin Luther King Pahrump Community Choir. It's a Martin Luther King Choir, and it's a group of churches that we come together and we practice so that we, you wouldn't think we practice, but we practice. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can put on this event. And then the dancers, of course. And the dancers are uh, from Pahrump and Las Vegas, and they are represented by uh, Rapunza Reed as their coach. And then, of course, we had the junior ROTC. Oh, and don't forget the, uh, my ROTC and the Key Club and um, Nye County Coalition. Um, those youth are so, I couldn't do it without them. Wonderful. So next year we're going for the 11th year. Pe can people donate to the Martin Luther King Scholarship all year long? Yes. Yes, uh, Martin Luther King has his own um, uh, account at Bank of America, and even $5 is uh, uh, appreciated because whatever you donate, it just accumulates, and then we can give that out. And uh, we appreciate even items because we have the raffle and the drawing and the silent auction. So anything that we can use to help make money uh, once a year, thank you. In the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we're free at last. The Bureau of Land Management Carson City District will begin the Flanagan Dogskin Mountain and Granite Peak Wild Horse Gather today. The gather is expected to take about five days. The BLM will remove approximately 283 excess wild horses and will treat and release approximately 22 to 36 mares from the Flanagan herd management area with PZP, a fertility control vaccine. These three HMAs are about 30 miles northeast of Reno, Nevada in Washoe County. Well, the final date to file for the Justice of the Peace for Judge Tina Brisbell's seat, who is retiring, was Friday. Nevada Highway Patrol Trooper Pat Walker has put his hat in the ring against seven other candidates.
Friday was the last day that you could apply to become a candidate for Justice of the Peace here at the Nye County Courthouse. We are going to speak to one of the candidates, Nevada Highway Patrol Trooper Pat Walker. Yes, I uh, signed up last week. I believe it was on uh, Wednesday of last week and uh, made myself an official candidate for uh, that seat. There you go. Who are we running against in this? Uh, to my knowledge, I believe there's six in the field of candidates. Uh, Ron Kent and, I hope I don't hurt his name, Louis DeCanio, uh, Charlie Watkins, uh, Mike Foley, and I believe Tom Britting. And I'm not sure. I don't know who he is. I, I know of the other candidates. Uh, but I think that's it. And myself, of course. You uh, yourself as a Nevada Highway Patrol trooper. Yes, that's what I do for a living, yes. And so you're going to be giving up your um, position as a trooper to, to go for this if you are in fact elected? Yes, that is true. If I am uh, fortunate enough that people find me worthy and I'm, and I'm elected to the seat, then yes, I would retire at about 21 years of service. Let's talk a little bit about your history and, uh, and your years of service as a trooper. I, I started out in 1992. Uh, I went through the academy and became a rural trooper at that time in Alamo, Nevada, up in Lincoln County. I served up there approximately six years. After that, I transferred up to Hawthorne and uh, worked in the Hawthorne, Mineral County, Lyon County, Yarrington areas, uh, Shures. Uh, after that, I came back and went to work in Las Vegas in the urban traffic where I had a, got, got a lot more uh, accident uh, uh, investigation uh, put to use. And then after that, I came out here, and I've been out here be five years in this next uh, one July. What prompted you to want to run for the seat? You know, I've been in law enforcement one way or the other ever since 1978. I started out my career in the Air Force as a security police officer. Uh, my family has a, a great background in law enforcement. I, I see the things I can do as, as a police officer, and then at the same time, I know what I believe I can do as a judge. Uh, to be honest, I've never really considered running for a sheriff's position, but I have always thought about going into the judicial. Uh, of course, in counties under 100,000, you don't have to have the law degrees or, or, or be a lawyer to do that. And so I, I see where Tina is retiring. Uh, you don't have the incumbent. I figured this would be a good time. Uh, I, I believe Charles Watkins kind of said the same thing. This is a good time. You're, 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 you're all starting out equal. And what do you hope to do in that seat? Well, the, the same thing I, I bring to my law enforcement experiences, fairness, uh, a, a sense of responsibility, and uh, to make the kind of decisions that people would like. You know, you're, you're the mediator between the accused and what the law says, and hopefully bring some common sense uh, to what needs to be done to get these people through their trying times. How can people find out more about you? Do you have a website right now for your um, candidacy or a phone number? Yes, there's going to be a website. It's getting set up. In fact, I got the appointment tomorrow. Uh, I'm working on getting my signs, all my cards, flyers, uh, different things, uh, the different accoutrements uh, that go with running uh, set up tomorrow. Uh, I'll put that out. Uh, hopefully, I'll get that uh, you know, to the, the media as soon as I can and out to the public. Uh, but uh, I'm still taking the baby steps, trying to get ready. This is Deanna O'Donnell for News 46. Well, the other candidates that are vying for that seat are Thomas Britting, Louis DiCanio, Michael Foley, Travis Huggins, Ron Kent, and Charlie Watkins. In a News 46 exclusive that we reported on in December of 2010, a church camp called Patch of Heaven in Amargosa was flooded when the Wildlife Service allegedly rerouted two streams. Now the Center for Justice and Constitutional Litigation and the Nevada Policy Research Institute has announced that it will represent Ministeria Roca Solita Church or Solid Rock Church. They have filed a claim with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for negligent and lawless actions by the agency that they say caused over $86,000 in damage to the church's camp. I guess I want to begin by saying we're delighted to come to the aid of uh, this client. Uh, our, our goal is to try and help people when government uh, gets in the way of their liberties. It's in a nutshell, our mission here. I think this is a very compelling story, and I think it's best told by the, the, the pastor of the church who's lived through it. Yes, my name is uh, Victor Fuentes, and I'm the quarter pastor for Ministerio Roca Solida Church in Las Vegas. We also own and operate um, the Pacho Heaven Camp in Amargosa Valley outside of uh, Pahrump. Uh, we purchased a 40-acre parcel in Amargosa Valley where um, we minister people and help them to, uh, to become a better person. By doing so, we invest 
about $1.2 million between the purchase of the land and the uh, rebuild of, of the camp. The camp have a, a river who flow through it, and that was the beauty of that land. That is why we bought the land, because it provides a peaceful place for us as a believer to go and rejoice and be reborn in and, and that part of uh, Nevada. In 2010, uh, the U.S. and Fish and Wildlife Service began to reroute that river away from our property. And uh, uh, I have to let you know that stream, that river, flowed through our prop property according to the information we have ever since the 1800s. And uh, the camp, a little bit after that, in 2010, in December the 23rd, right before Christmas, that river overflowed the, the rerouting uh, the fishing wire life did and flood our camp with mud and muddy waters and uh, severely damaged the camp, the buildings, and other property uh, inside the, the camp. And I have to tell you that this was devastating for us and, and to see all the work, the hard work that we have put into Patch of Heaven to rebuild, to create a, a place for, for, for the Christian community to come and relax, being devastated by the, by the water and by the wrongful doing of Fish and Wildlife uh, US government. Um, we are a uh, modest church. We don't have too much money. The money that we have, we have invested it in the camp and in people. We don't have the money to fight the government. That is why we are grateful uh, to be represented by Joseph Becker and the Center for Justice. If you would like to see the entire press conference that was held last week in Las Vegas regarding the Patch of Heaven Church camp in Amargosa and the pending lawsuit, you can go to kpvm.tv. Well, we're going to have more with News 46's News and Review, so please keep it here. Harump's most watched and number one media source for local news and weather with Deanna O'Donnell. And welcome back again to News 46's Week in Review. By a 3-2 to two vote, the Board of County Commissioners agreed to pay the severance package for the former county manager, Rick Osborne. The present assistant county manager will be taking over his duties until she retires in March. And of course, her name is Pam Webster. And uh, of course, we'll keep you updated on that story. A presentation was held at the Prompt Nugget for the Town of Prompt's Community Assessment Report. The community assessment report is in. It's going to be presented tonight from 6 to 8 p.m. here. It's going to actually go over the findings of the surveys and the listening sessions that were done last October. Tell everybody what the community assessment actually is. The community assessment was basically a series of listening sessions where we went to different groups, such as the Chamber of Commerce, the Senior Center, the high school, veterans, what have you, and we asked the same three questions at every single listening session. And those three questions in this order were as follows. What do you perceive to be the weaknesses in Pahrump? The second question is what do you perceive to be the strengths of Pahrump? And the third question is what would you personally like to see in the way of priorities going forward, either short term in the next year or two or long term, 5, 10 or 20 years? They asked these same three questions at about 19 different listening sessions. About 300 people participated in that. They went back, wrote up their notes, culminated in a 111-page detailed report. And they're going to present some of those findings tonight. And anyone who's interested can go on to the Town of Prompt website or to the Nye County Administration website and actually read this report online or download it as they please. And no shared vision between the town and the county. Um, Leadership. People would like to see more leadership from both the town board and the county commission. The most importantly, and this came up in every single listening session, was the decorum. People, people really um, voiced a concern on the lack of decorum in the governance of the town and the county. There were people that we talked to that said they would like to be more involved. 
in the town. They would like to volunteer to do things, but they're afraid to because they, they don't want to go to a town board meeting and, and suggest something or volunteer for something just to have the next person come up behind them and say, oh, that's the craziest idea I've ever heard. That will never work. Give me the bottom line. What's the recommendation? The bottom line is when you see the report, they broke their findings into six key areas. Those areas are economic development, education, governance, quality of life, image and communications. And based on that, when they present tonight, what they're asking the citizens to do is saying, this is what you told us and this is where you're at and these are the things that you were most concerned about. Now, moving forward, if you want to make some things happen, this is not a to-do list for the town board. This is not a to-do list for the Board of County Commissioners. This is for active citizens to become engaged down here. So if you have a passion for something, whether it be a movie theater or fairgrounds, if you think there's something you'd like to see here, start to initiate it through a local citizens activity group, form a task force, set some priorities and plans, and move forward on this. They also give you in this report a series of resources and additional support that you can get from outside the county to go forward on any one of these areas. Jeff Dennis is on the transplant list for a kidney. He has been called three times in the past three years to receive his much needed don donor kidney. However, he can't have this life-saving surgery. What is the price of a life? Only $5,000 in this case. Uh, well, I'm trying to raise um, a minimum $5,000 uh, to cover insurance for a little over a year to cover the post-transplant medications from a kidney transplant. And I've been on dialysis for about three and a half years now. I've been called three times already, and they wouldn't give me the transplant because I wasn't financially able to pay for the medication, so I'm just trying to raise some money. So they won't do the transplant until you have the money for this because this is medication that you have to take for the rest of your life, right? Yes. So that you don't reject the donor kidney. So tell me what that's like. You get all these phone calls, but uh, they can't do anything about it. Uh, it's very frustrating because it's just, you know, delaying my life. You know, I'm on dialysis 10 hours a night, seven days a week, and I just want to get it over with. So I know that your family's kind of put this fundraiser, fundraiser together here at the Maverick, and a lot of people have donated monkey bars, donated five hundred dollars worth of, worth of uh, things, so people can have raffles and stuff. Right. Yes. My mother, my my mother's friend, she knew how to do these uh, types of fundraisers, and she's she's helped out a lot. And we're gonna see if we can you know raise the money needed. I know we've seen signs out all over town, and uh, they've really done a lot of legwork for this fundraiser. You're only thirty years old. Yes. Tell me a little bit about yourself personally. Well, I'm originally from California. I moved here three and a half years ago when I found out about my condition to you know, be close to the family. And the transplant waiting list in Nevada is much shorter than California. And you can see that it is because you've yes. been called three times. So how much funds do you have or you need You need 5,000 more? Right now I've, I've raised nothing. So after tonight we'll see what happens. And I know that there's a website that they can go to, which is helphopelive.org. Yes, it's helphopelive.org, and you just type in my name or to find a patient, and they could donate uh, online, credit card, or phone call, and all uh, donations are for medical reimbursement only. And uh, will you be having any other fundraisers? Do you know? Uh, I'm not sure what they have going on right now. We might. Um, I want to check up on that. You'll keep us posted on how you're doing, and of course, we wish you the best. If people have any questions, who can they call? 702-497-0553. Uh, well, Nevada is going to have its Democratic Caucus this weekend. We speak to Jan Bears. Well, this weekend in the caucus, we will be registering voters. We'll be electing our delegates. We'll be showing our preference for our presidential candidate, Barack Obama. We... Um, it allows us to build a base to work with from with our volunteers. It also has us build our party platform. And I think it's a really exciting time for people to come out. Um, I want to make an, everybody to make a note of if you're going to be um, able to vote, um, which when I say able to vote, I'm referring to the fact that if you're going to turn 18 before November 6th and you want to be a Democrat and you want to come in caucus, you can come out and we'll register to vote. If you need to change your registration to a Democrat, if you need to um, 
you know, do any of these things. We can handle this for you at the caucus. Now the caucus is going to be held at the high school. Mm -hmm. It's going to, we're going to start registration. We'll open up the doors around 1030. We'll register voters at 11 o'clock. At 1130, if you're in line, we'll register you. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're but 11, at 1130, we close the doors. Okay, we have to do that because that's when we have to start at 1130 and we do our uh, presidential preferences at noon. Mm -hmm. So I would like for everybody to please come out and join us. Thank you very much. If you need further information on this, you can call 1-866-737-3367 or you can go to www.pledgetocaucus.com. Quilts for Cancer was a big winner at this weekend's poker tournament, which was held to help the group purchase supplies to help veterans in need. We spoke to Barbara Johnston. Yes, it's a poker tournament that the Prump is hosting for us, Quilts for Cancer, um, for us to purchase supplies to finish making all the quilts for our veterans in need. Uh, we have about 28, 30 players here today, so we'll be raising some good amount of money so we can buy wholesale bulk purchases. There's a $60 buy-in? Yes, it is. It was $60. 25 goes to us, the charity, 25 for the winner's pot, and $10 to the nugget for the cost that they incurred during the tournament. We've been doing this for a number of years. How many years? This is just our second year. The nugget has done it for other charities. This is our second tournament this year. I know that we have uh, Jeff Von Aust out there conducting. Yes, Jeff is out here someplace busy at work. He's the one that sets it up for us. And we are assisted by Bill Kobarker and Bill Dolan, and they chaired the event. I know very little about poker, so I'm just here, you know, representing the charity. This is a great event. And this is um, all for the quilts that we donate to the veterans, right? Correct, it is. It all goes to our supplies. We have some tremendous volunteers that donate all of their time, and we um, try and purchase all the fabric and batting for the quilt making. How can people donate at any other time to Quilts for Cancer or help out or um, even volunteer their time? Just give me a call at 775-751. 5356. We are a 501c3 charity, so any donations they do give are tax deductible as allowed by law. Tell everybody what Quilts for Cancer actually does. We make quilts for people with cancer and as well as others in the community in need. If it's children or veterans, um, we just cover as many people as we can with a comfort quilt. Well, if you naturally have a green thumb and enjoy learning all you can about gardening, then the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension is the place to be. We do. In fact, we have a brand new one starting this coming Monday. It'll be twice a month, the second and the fourth Monday of every month from 5 p.m. to 6.30. Uh, producers, it's for people who garden, it's for people who like to sell their produce. Uh, they're going to start off with um, commercial growers, how to help you have better produce, better yields. Mm -hmm. um, that's available here. Um, we have uh, January, we have February and March scheduled up to this point, but I imagine it's going to probably go year round. What time is that class? Uh, 5 to 6.30. So people can find out more by just calling here. Is there a fee? No, there's no fee for this class. What other classes do we have going on? Well, actually, this Saturday morning, we have M.L. Robinson, our area specialist, coming out. Uh, he's going to be doing a free pruning demonstration in our garden. Mm -hmm. Be here at 9. Show up with your pruners if you like, if you want to get a hands-on. Mm -hmm. And then at 1 p.m., we have our Pick and Learn series, where you can go out into our vegetable garden at 1 p.m., mm -hmm. and we have Master Gardeners going to show you just getting started for your spring garden. And is there a fee for any of those? No, that's free. Saturday, just come down. Come down. Where are we located? Uh, we're on the corner of Calvat and Dandelion. And for more information, where can they call? 727-5532. Nye County will receive $3.8 million from the U.S. Department of Energy. The payment is according to an agreement with Nye County in which the DOE agrees to pay the county 3% of total funds appropriated for nuclear waste disposal, up to $300 million. We caught up with Commissioner Gary Hollis at the Pahrump Valley Historical Museum before the announcement was made last Tuesday at the county commissioner's meeting. Uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about is a repository uh, even needed? <clears throat> Can the waste be uh, transported safely? Uh, is leaving the waste where it is uh, a solution? And uh, is Yucca Mountain geologically safe? Is Yucca Mountain a dead issue right now? Tell me what's going on. 
No, it's not a dead issue. Uh, there's going to be some uh, court uh, proceedings that have to go on with the D.C. Circuit. Uh, um, when the next election, there could be a, a different uh, number of senators, and that's where we uh, end up getting bogged down is in the Senate where uh, Senator Reed is able to, uh, to, to stop any funding. So, uh, no, Yucca Mountain's not dead. Matter of fact, it's, uh, it was on uh, life support, and, and it's not on life support now, and it's, uh, we're talking about it every day. What does Yucca Mountain mean to Knight County as far as jobs and in the economy? Well, Tuesday I'll be giving you a, a little something new, and I, I'll probably go ahead and give it to you today. Um, me and my staff have been working for the last year, a little over a year, for another pet check because um, with the 2010-2011 uh, FY year, uh, they had a continuous resolution, and that put money in uh, the budget for Yucca Mountain. And well, we have a, a contract with DOE that says if there's any money allocated to Yucca Mountain under $300 million, the county gets 3%. If it's over 300 million, we get 2.5%. So in this case, there was money put in there. We fought for over a year. And uh, on Tuesday, I'll be making the announcement uh, to accept DOE's offer for $3.8 million. Wow. Where's that going to be going to? <clears throat> uh, that's up to the board. So that's quite a bit of money there. and. Uh, Usually it goes into what we call the 492 account. That can be dispersed in different um, areas around the, the Nye County. Yeah, but with this budget time that we have uh, uh, and uh, the low interest rates that we're giving on our uh, accounts, uh, we'll probably want to put that away. Uh, my, my thing would be put it away so that we'll have enough interest to pay the bond for the jail. Well, as you know, the election is drawing near. It's in November. We spoke to one of the two candidates for the current district court judge seat, Kim Walker, who's seeking re-election. Yes, uh, what happens is when you get appointed, you get appointed to the next election, and then you run for the end of that uh, particular judge's term, which is to 2014. So I'm running here in 2012, mm -hmm. um, which is exciting. I'm looking forward to it. How long have you been on the bench now? Since July 1st. How's it going? It's great. It's uh, pretty exciting. You know, a judge really should be, uh, has really three roles. One is the adjudicator, which most people see on the bench. The second is a manager, so we not only manage our calendars and, and look for improvements in the judicial system. And then third is finally a community leader. So I've tried to implement all three things. Um, we have some exciting things going on. I took over uh, the drug court from Judge Lane, who had successfully run it for eight years. Uh, he needed a break, and we're doing community service. If you are unemployed, you do 20 hours of community service a week. So that's exciting. Um, I'm looking at a way to modernize uh, the courtroom. I've been working on some things and uh, a little premature to announce those at this point, but uh, it's very, very exciting for us and I think may make the 5th Judicial District Court uh, the leader among district courts in the state of Nevada, so I'm pretty excited about that. I know that you have another opponent that's announced, uh, Nancy Lord, and uh, you have to run now, and then like you said, again again in two more years, and then after that you get to have a six-year term um, if you're elected to the seat. Tell me a little bit about what you hope to do um, in, coming up. Well, you know, in terms of the election, um, I'm a pretty down-to-earth, basic person. I like to say, judge is what I do, Kim is who I am. And uh, and I think you'll find that I'm pretty approachable, and you'll see me out and about um, throughout the entire judicial district. I think sometimes people fail to realize that the 5th Judicial District is the third largest in the country. We cover 300 miles, and in my first, from July 1st to uh, December 31st, uh, on my own, I traveled a little over 4,000 miles uh, attending events throughout the judicial district, not just in the Prump area. And also, you also have to uh, attend court or, or, or 
be at the courts all over Nye County, don't you? Uh, Nye Mineral and Esmeralda counties, it's uh, 300 miles between the uh, courthouse in Pahrump and our final courthouse, which is Mineral County in uh, Hawthorne. Um, and we have some real challenges. Uh, the courthouse in Mineral County didn't have internet until almost, uh, a, not quite a month ago. So we have some uh, challenges as a rural district court judge. Well, that's all, folks, for News 46's Week in Review. Some of this weekend's events include... The Democratic Caucus, that's going to be... Doors will be opening at 11.30 a.m. at Pahrump Valley High School, I believe. Yes, and uh, I believe that the caucus starts around 1 p.m., but okay. uh, uh, if you want to get involved, um, you have to show up. It's at that new cafeteria at the high school, so in the new portion of the high school. And, of course, that uh, candlelight vigil will be held at Pahrump Valley Boulevard and Casey Streets for Michael Flannery. And uh, we hear that there might be rain. We have a weatherman here to find out <laughs> all about that. So if there is rain and wind, normally at the candlelight vigils, it's customary to not bring a candle, but a flashlight or something mm -hmm. similar to that. And uh, definitely um, button up and wear some warm clothing. And uh, it's gonna all be out there to honor Michael and uh, the tragic uh, death and um, his tragic life. Tragic indeed, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I'm Deanne O'Donnell for News 46. And I'm Zach Fuentes. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you again here next week. Good night.